My name is Catherine. When I was little, my mother divorced my father and raised me as a single mom. We weren't wealthy, and even as a child, my dream was to become rich and live in a high-rise apartment. So I studied hard and worked part-time while in school, eventually getting into a medical university. Afterward, I obtained my medical license and, after working in plastic surgery, I am now working as a cosmetic surgeon. Even after my salary increased significantly, I continued saving diligently without wasting money. And by the time I was 30, I had saved enough to buy a high-rise apartment. As a token of appreciation, I also send money to my mother, who raised me while working. There were times when I had a boyfriend, but since I wasn't fixated on marriage and focused on my career, I found myself turning 30 without realizing it. As I was thinking that maybe getting married would put my mother's mind at ease, I got a call from my high school friend, Bob. Bob and I used to hang out a lot but we naturally lost touch after entering college and we hadn't had the chance to meet since then. So feeling nostalgic, I decided to meet up with Bob. When I saw Bob after a long time, he seemed calmer than in high school and I felt that we had both grown up. Our conversation flowed naturally and I found myself gradually attracted to Bob who kept me entertained. We went out for meals a few times and after Bob asked me out, we started dating. We ended up getting married when I was 31. Can I talk to you about something before we get married? Sure. What's up? I've been working hard and saving money since I was a student, and it's always been my dream to buy a high-rise apartment. What? I had no idea you had such a dream but I don't have the income to buy a high-rise apartment. It's not that I want you to buy it. I want to buy it myself. Wow. Do you really have enough money to buy a high-rise apartment? If you want to buy it, that's fine with me. I don't have any strong preference for a house. I'm glad to hear that. I've already found an apartment I like. Would you come with me to check it out? So, we went to see the apartment together, and I fell in love with it at first sight. Thinking about the future, I decided to buy a three-bedroom unit. Since I'm frugal and didn't want to waste money on interest, I decided to pay for it all at once. I considered putting both our names on the deed, but having seen my parents' divorce up close, I decided to keep it in my name only just in case. However, I had no idea at the time that this decision would later help me. I feel pathetic having you pay for everything, Catherine. Don't say that. I just bought what I wanted. Thank you so much. I don't know if I deserve to live in such an amazing place. When we first moved in, Bob was hesitant and I regretted buying the high-rise apartment a little. Maybe buying the apartment before getting married hurt Bob's pride. But having watched my mother since I was a child, I never felt the need to rely on a man. Whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, people get used to their environment. And within a week, Bob started to enjoy living in the high-rise apartment. Seeing Bob excitedly going to the gym on the first floor or taking the elevator to the top floor for no reason, like a child, reminded me of his innocent side in high school. He still has a childlike side. I couldn't help but find Bob adorable. As we began our married life, I made an agreement with Bob. We would each manage our own finances instead of having a joint account split the living expenses equally and we would save $200 each month jointly. Bob was reluctant at first, but after I convinced him that we would help each other if needed, he agreed. A few weeks later, we registered our marriage and started our newlywed life. Once again, nice to officially be with you. Yes, looking forward to it. Our newlywed life was going well. Both Bob and I were busy with work, 
but on our days off, we enjoyed watching movies at home or spontaneously going on day trips, making every day fun. One day, Bob asked me about a dinner party. We didn't have a wedding, right? I want to introduce you to my college friends on our next day off. Can I invite them over? Sure, that's fine on a day off. I never really dreamed of having a wedding and had few relatives, so we decided not to have a wedding ceremony to avoid making my mother feel uncomfortable. Bob's mother, Sarah, complained a bit, but his father convinced her, and since Bob wasn't enthusiastic about it either, we just took some wedding photos and that was it. So, I hadn't met most of Bob's friends, and I thought this dinner party would be a great opportunity. On the day of the dinner, two men and two women were coming over, and I nervously greeted them. Hello. Welcome. Come on in. Everyone, make yourselves at home. Nice to meet you. I'm Catherine. Nice to meet you. Bob, you did well. She's beautiful. This place is so spacious and clean. Everyone was sharing their thoughts. Bob, this house is amazing. Yeah, it was tough. I saved up little by little. What? I bought it though. I couldn't say anything, but it seemed like Bob's friends thought he had bought the house. He probably got carried away and said it himself. I understood that it's common for the man to buy the house and considered Bob's pride, so I kept quiet. I want to live in a place like this too, Bob. Give me one of the rooms too. A female friend named Emily joked with Bob. If Catherine's okay with it, I'll get it ready. Bob seemed in a great mood from all the compliments, and the two of them were laughing together, their faces close. I felt uneasy about how close they were, and when I looked around, I noticed the other friends seemed uncomfortable too. Then, Emily suddenly turned to me and said, It's great that Bob bought you such a nice house. What is that supposed to mean? It's like she's saying, you didn't do anything. I contributed money too. I paid for all of it. I was angry at Emily's attitude and wanted to counter her, even just a little. Oh, really? Oh, right. You're a cosmetic surgeon. I could never go for plastic surgery. For some reason, she knew about my profession, which bothered me, but I tried not to let it get to me, and I felt that continuing to talk to Emily would be pointless, so I forced a smile. Still, Emily continued to attack me under the guise of being friendly. Bob, don't let Catherine boss you around. Catherine, if you need to know anything about Bob, just ask me. I know him best. Throughout the rest of the dinner party, Emily kept making tactless comments, and the other friends had to step in to smooth things over. The atmosphere became uncomfortable, and we ended the party early. Emily left looking bored. That was fun. Catherine, you must be tired, right? Thanks. I'm a bit tired, but it's okay. Emily is really something. Yeah, she's really cute. I intended my comment to be sarcastic, but Bob complimented her. What? Oh yeah, she's cute, but... Emily is always very close with people. Sorry about that. Bob smiled happily. Indeed, Emily sat next to Bob during dinner and was quite touchy. Yeah, it seemed like you two were really close. I found it hard to talk to her. You're just too smart, Catherine. Emily is a typical modern girl. Why does he always side with Emily? I see. Sorry, but I'm tired, so I'm going to bed. I couldn't stay calm, so I went to bed feeling uneasy. After that, Bob started going out with his friends more often. I don't like being controlling, so I didn't say anything.
but our first year of marriage wasn't as enjoyable as I had hoped. Then, as we entered our second year of marriage, Bob suddenly said something surprising. I'm thinking about changing jobs. I don't feel like I belong at my current company. There's a lot of overtime, and all my bosses are jerks. He started complaining more and more about his job. Even though he said there was a lot of overtime, it was only about two hours at most and only a few times a month. But I don't think your overtime is that bad and your salary is pretty good. Wouldn't it be a shame to quit? Are you going to a job that pays more? Work isn't all about money, you know? Well, that's true. Work isn't just about money. I felt a bit guilty for my narrow perspective. And since we don't have a mortgage, it should be fine, right? Your money is our family's money, isn't it? It's okay if I don't work for a while. But if we have kids, I won't be able to work for a while, so I'd like to save up while I can. So, you're okay with me getting depressed? What? Why would you say that? Because you're pushing me to keep working when I'm struggling. But you've never complained about your job before. If it's that bad, maybe you should see a doctor? Bob looked a bit panicked. No, it's not that bad. But anyway, I'm definitely changing jobs. It seemed like Bob was set on changing jobs and wouldn't listen to anything else. All right, but find a new job before you quit. I set this condition, and he agreed. However, a month later, Bob quit his job without having secured another one. Wait, you quit without finding a new job? What are you going to do next? Don't worry. I'm asking one of my friends if I can interview at her company. When I pressed Bob about it, I was surprised by his unexpected answer. Your friend's company? Yeah, she works at a restaurant, and I thought I might work there. Is that a full-time position? Well, probably. Bob answered while avoiding eye contact, and I suddenly felt a rush of anxiety that it might be a part-time job. Of course, I have no problem with a woman working and the man being a stay-at-home husband, but we don't have kids, and I currently do most of the housework, so I couldn't picture Bob doing it. If it's not a full-time position, look for something else. I made sure to lay down this condition. Will it really be okay if Bob and I have kids? From that day on, I started feeling less enthusiastic about having children. A few days later, Bob went to the interview and got the job, but it turned out to be a part-time position, not full-time. Are you really going to take that job? Sorry, it's part-time, but Emily said if I work hard, I can become a full-time employee. Emily? Bob looked like he had let something slip. Do you mean Emily, the one who came over to our house before? Well, yeah, that's right. When I told her I was in trouble, Emily introduced me to the job. So, he's going to work part-time at the restaurant where Emily works. Remembering how close Bob and Emily seemed and how openly hostile she was to me, I felt a headache coming on. Why didn't you tell me about this? I thought you'd get jealous. But really, we're just friends. Bob spoke nonchalantly. And you quit your job for this? Well, I'm not sure yet, but I want to give it a try. Since he's already got the job, it's better than being unemployed. All right. I forced myself to accept it and replied with difficulty. However, a month after starting work at the restaurant, Bob began coming home late more often. Even on early shifts, he sometimes wouldn't get home until after midnight, and he increasingly came home in the morning after drinking. 
I'm working overtime, so I can't help it. Bob said this, but the restaurant was supposed to close at 9 p.m. It would be fine if he was just getting along with his co-workers, but knowing Emily was there made me uneasy. You were late again today. Everyone loves to go out for drinks. I don't want to go, but since I'm the newbie, I have to. But are you okay with money? Well, I spent a lot this month, so I can't cover the living expenses or savings. Since switching to the restaurant job, Bob stopped contributing financially. It's one thing if he couldn't pay because of a lower income, but he was spending all his money on drinking, and I was shocked by his lack of planning. Make sure you pay next month. I know. Bob said with a carefree smile. However, he continued going out drinking and coming home in the morning, not changing his behavior. I kept covering the living expenses, and since Bob wasn't saving the agreed $200 each month, I stopped saving as well. What are we going to do in the future? As I was feeling anxious, an even greater tragedy was about to strike me. Catherine, I need to talk to you. What's up? My mom is getting a divorce, and she wants to live with us. A divorce? Yeah, according to her, my dad is cheating, but my dad says he's fed up because she just lies around all day and doesn't do any housework or work. I thought his dad might be right. When I visited their home, it was always messy. I had never seen Sarah cook. She always ordered takeout. Sarah also had a sharp tongue and was very blunt, so I didn't like her much. The idea of living with her was unthinkable to me. I'm sorry, Bob, but living together would be tough for me. Why? I'm not close to Sarah, and I'm not confident I could get along with her. I see. Then Bob looked at me coldly and said, I've thought this for a while, but you're a cold person, Catherine. His comment made me snap. How can you say that? Why should I take care of your mom when you're not even contributing to our living expenses? What? How can you say that? I'm spending money on socializing. These connections will help with my future job. Your mind is always on money, Catherine. He hit a sore spot, but it was his behavior that made me think this way. There's a spare room, so it's fine, right? Okay, but only for three months. Sarah should be able to find another place to live in that time. If that's the case, then fine. You're so stingy. All right. So, we ended up living with Sarah temporarily, but from the first day, she had a nasty attitude toward me. Catherine, it's been a while. I haven't seen you in so long I almost forgot your face. You've aged, haven't you? Nice to see you again. I've been busy with work and haven't had time to visit. I can't believe she's acting like this when she's going to be living in my house. Mom, don't say things like that. Here, you can use this room. I was also angry at Bumper laughing it off. This house is amazing. Once you live here, you can't go back to other places. Catherine, are you doing some dangerous work or something? Her crude laughter echoed. If I don't find her a place soon, my sanity won't hold up. Make sure to find a place quickly and ask her to move out. Don't say things like that on the first day. I whispered to Bob, who looked annoyed. Living with Sarah, who doesn't even say thank you or nice to see you, is going to be tough. Bob probably won't side with me. As expected, living with Sarah was truly challenging. Dinner is ready. Please help yourself. Oh, how fancy. It doesn't look very tasty, though. I'm sorry. I hope it suits your taste. 
It seems a bit off. Sarah would criticize my cooking, but still ask for seconds. Moreover, when I was cleaning, she would yell at me. Hey, I can't hear the TV. Are you doing this on purpose to annoy me? I'm sorry. I have to clean now because I have to go to work soon. Can't you do it after you get back? Are you hinting that you want me to leave? She would yell and boss me around no matter what I did. I was so stressed that I asked Bob to do something about Sarah's attitude. Mom is hurt from the divorce. Let her have her way a little. There was no way she seemed hurt at all. But Sarah just watches TV all day and doesn't help with anything. Mom is a guest. She doesn't have to do housework. Bob always sided with Sarah. But he didn't take care of her and still came home late just like before, which made me angry. His current salary was only half of what he used to make, around $20,000 a year. Despite this, he spent his nights drinking and didn't help with the housework. Bob, you need to help with the housework. It's harder with an extra person, and I'm busy with work too. I'm busy with work as well. I'm working hard as the breadwinner. Breadwinner? How is Bob the breadwinner when he still doesn't contribute to the living expenses? Then hurry up and find Sarah a place to live. I'm at my limit. Well, but mom seems to be enjoying living here, so let's let her stay a bit longer. No way. If that's the case, you need to help out more. What? What else do you want me to do? I was too exasperated to respond. I couldn't see a future with Bob anymore, and the thought of divorce filled my mind. Time kept passing, and Sarah's attitude got even worse. The promised three months had long passed, but she showed no signs of finding her own place. Catherine, I'm going out tomorrow, so give me some money. No, please ask Bob for it. Bob is working hard with his small salary. I can't take money from him. I'm working hard too. All you do is make excuses. It's not an excuse. And you need to find your own place soon. We agreed on three months, didn't we? We never made that agreement. Can't you take care of your mother-in-law? Hand over your wallet. Sarah forcibly took my wallet and took $100. I told Bob about it when he came home late that night. $100 is nothing to you, Catherine. Just do something nice for my mom. Do something nice with your own money. I told you, I don't have any money. That's because you spend it all on drinking. Come home without drinking. If I build these relationships, it'll help with my future job, right? Bob always says this. It's not even business entertainment, just part-time co-workers drinking together. How is that supposed to help his future? When is it going to help? I don't think it ever will. When I said that, Bob sulked. He scratched his head irritably. Anyway, take care of my mom. With that, Bob escaped to his room. I realized it was pointless to say anything to him. Then Sarah started stealing money from my wallet when I wasn't looking. Since confronting her only led to yelling, I began noting down the contents of my wallet when I got home, keeping track of when and how much money was taken. I wanted proof, so I set up a video camera to record the room and caught Sarah stealing money from my wallet on tape. The reason I couldn't bring myself to divorce Bob despite everything was that I didn't want to worry my mother. Be happy with Bob. I didn't want to betray the words my mother told me when I got married, so I felt I had to avoid divorce at all costs. But living my life as their ADM was something I couldn't bear and I didn't know what to do or who to turn to for help. Still, the housework kept piling up, and I was the only one doing it, holding back tears as I worked. 
One day, when I reached into Bob's pants pocket while doing the laundry, I found a photo. It was of Bob and Emily with I love you written on it. So they really were having an affair. I quickly took a picture of it and put the pants back without washing them. The next day, when I checked the pants, the photo was gone. He doesn't help with anything, doesn't address the issues with Sarah, and now he's cheating. I don't need a man like this in my life. The thread holding me together snapped, and I resolved to get a divorce. That day, I finished work early and went straight to a detective agency. My husband, Bob, is having an affair, but I don't have much evidence. Can you investigate? Sure. It'll take about a week. Is that okay? I was worried if they could gather evidence in just a week, but about five days later, I received a call from the agency and rushed over. Bob is indeed cheating. Here are the photos. A lot of photos were spread out on the desk. They showed Bob and Emily walking arm in arm, going to Emily's house, and even holding hands on the street. Do you know this person? Yes, that's Emily, a friend of Bob's. She's been to our house once. I found a photo of them together in Bob's pants pocket. I see. Since we could take this many photos in just five days, it seems he's visiting her frequently. I took the evidence to a lawyer and started the process of getting a divorce. That night, I called my mom. Hello, Mom. How have you been? I'm good. I'm so happy you called. How are you, Catherine? Hearing her voice, I started to cry. Catherine, are you okay? Did something happen? I want to get a divorce. I'm sorry I couldn't be happy. Crying, I told my mom everything that had happened. She listened without interrupting and stayed with me until the end. You don't need to stay with someone who doesn't value you. It's okay to leave and find happiness afterward. You don't need to apologize. Thank you, Mom. She kept talking to me on the phone until I stopped crying and listening to her voice, I realized that she was the only family I needed. A few days later, I was sleeping in my room when I woke up to the sound of Sarah and Bob talking. Sarah's voice was loud, so I could hear everything. Hurry up and get Catherine out of here. I know. I think Emily will love living here. I quickly turned on my phone's voice recorder. The mortgage is paid off, right? Just get Catherine out and let Emily move in. Bob, make sure your name is on the deed. Oh, I can just change it without her knowing. Change the name on the deed? I don't know what they're planning, but I need to gather all the house documents quickly. Emily is much nicer than that arrogant Catherine. Bring her over next time. Got it. Once we get divorced, I'll get half of Catherine's money and we'll be rich. Exactly. Just get all her stuff out of the house. That sounds like a plan. Their voices were loud and clear, and I got everything recorded. I was determined not to let them take my house or money. The next day, I consulted my lawyer again and came up with a plan. They'll have to pay for betraying and using me all this time. From then on, I continued to act as if everything was normal so they wouldn't suspect my plans. I pretended that Bob's affair and Sarah's abusive words didn't bother me. I endured it all with the thought that I would never forgive them. A few days later, their plan to kick me out was put into action. My belongings were piled up in the entrance. Today is the day, right? I deliberately pretended to be surprised and raised my voice. Of course, I had my voice recorder on. Hey Bob, what is this? You're finally back. We packed your stuff for you. 
Sarah, what is going on? It means get out of here. You don't have a room here anymore. Starting tomorrow, this will be Emily's room. Unlike you, Emily is charming and cute, the perfect wife for Bob. We don't need you. Isn't it strange for me to leave? Shut up, you're always talking back. That's why Bob is fed up with you. Sarah shouted with a scary face. When I looked toward the back of the room for Bob, he approached me with a pleased look on his face. Surprised? It's your fault. Here, take the divorce papers. This was exactly what I wanted. Really, that's perfect because I want a divorce too. But this house is mine, you know? When you get divorced, it's normal for the wife to leave. Don't you even know that? So, neither of you are leaving. Understood. For now, I'll leave today. Not just today, leave forever. To make sure they hit rock bottom, I packed my things and left. That night, I stayed at a business hotel and filled out the divorce papers, submitting them first thing in the morning. Then I went straight to my lawyer. I finally submitted the divorce papers. Please send the invoices for the alimony. They're already prepared. My lawyer sent an invoice of $20,000 to Bob and $20,000 to Emily, and we also decided to demand $5,000 from Sarah as compensation for the money she had stolen. I then went to a real estate agent and signed the sales contract for the apartment. A few days later, I got a call from Bob. What the hell is this? Why do I have to pay alimony? And what's this about eviction? I found plenty of evidence of your affair, so you owe me alimony. And since the divorce is finalized, I sold the apartment because I don't need it anymore. The real estate agent wants to clean it up and sell it quickly, so you need to move out. I had a real estate agent I knew show the apartment and put it up for sale while Bob and Sarah were out. Of course, it was priced lower than the market rate due to the circumstances, but I didn't care. I had considered keeping the apartment, but the thought of living where they had stayed made me sick, so I decided to sell it and kick them out. What are you talking? You can't sell it without my permission. And I didn't cheat. Don't make me laugh. That apartment was bought with my money and is under my name from before we got married. So I have every right to sell it. As I spoke, I sent the affair photos to Bob's messaging app one by one. What is this? I'll apologize for the affair, but please spare the house. Spare the house? It's my house, and you didn't even contribute to the living expenses. You even cheated on me. You have no right to live there. Then I received a message from Bob. It was a photo of the house deed with Bob's name handwritten on the ownership section. Look, my name is on it too. Did you write that by hand? Do you seriously think that would work? But when I asked them to change the name, they said I couldn't do it without you. I thought this might work. I was astonished by Bob's ignorance. If you think that's going to work, why don't you ask a lawyer? By the way, that's a fake deed I made on my computer. After hearing you talk, I left it there on purpose. What the hell? You tricked me. Where are we supposed to live now? That's not my problem. Maybe a hotel or a cheap apartment? Then, I could hear Sarah yelling in the background. My mom is old. Don't you feel sorry for her? If she can yell that much, it means she's healthy. Have her get a job somewhere. What a woman. Better than a man who doesn't pay for anything, cheats, and tries to steal my house. Now, Pay the alimony quickly. Or should we settle this in court? I don't have money for a court case. Please, at least lower the alimony. 
Bob's voice sounded like he was about to cry. The alimony is standard, so don't worry. But I need it all at once. If that's not possible, let's take it to court. I'll win, though. No way. I heard Bob's weak voice, but I felt no sympathy. Don't be ridiculous. Suddenly, Sarah took the phone. Oh, it's good to hear you're doing well. Please return all the money you stole from my wallet. I have footage of you stealing it. The money and the apartment are mine. You really are an insolent woman. Yes, I'm insolent, and I will never forgive you. From now on, contact me through my lawyer. Even though they called me repeatedly after that, I ignored all their calls. When it got too persistent, I had my lawyer give them a warning call, and the call stopped immediately. I successfully divorced Bob and sold the apartment. Later, the real estate agent contacted me because they wouldn't vacate the apartment, so I hired movers to retrieve my belongings and headed over there. I unlocked the door and entered with the movers. Catherine, what are you doing here? That's my TV. Ignoring Bob and Sarah, I began the moving process, one item after another. Stop it. Then Emily approached me. Catherine, please stop. I want to be happy here with Bob. I see. But this is my house, and I've already sold it. You have no right to live here, so please leave. You can live together if you buy them this house. I said this and packed all my belongings into the truck. Emily seemed shocked to learn that the apartment was mine. You have one week to move out. After that, the real estate agent will remove the rest of your things and change the locks. So I suggest you leave soon. I closed the door and took a deep breath. It's finally over. A wave of accomplishment and exhaustion hit me. I moved to a distant place to ensure I would never see Bob and Sarah again. Later, I heard that they quickly found an apartment and moved out. I gave them a week's grace period, which was more than enough since I could have them forcibly evicted. They should be grateful. Emily, thinking she could live in the high-rise apartment, immediately broke up with Bob when she found out she couldn't. Bob paid the alimony immediately after the divorce, but Emily never got to live in the high-rise apartment, so she searched for me, claiming I had been deceived and demanding my money back, but she couldn't find me. In the end, she resorted to threatening Bob, which led to her being reported to the police. Additionally, Emily was already disliked by her friends for flirting with their boyfriends. When rumors of the affair spread, she lost all her friends. Her company also found out about the affair and the threats, and she was asked to resign. Later, Bob and I had a meeting about the division of property with our lawyer present. I won't agree to the divorce without dividing the property. Oh, did you forget about this paper? I took out the notarized document that outlined the division of property at the time of our divorce. Oh. We agreed before marriage not to divide the property, right? Instead, we were supposed to save $200 a month together and split it in case of divorce. But you stopped contributing, so I stopped too. You can only divide half of the $4,800 we saved for a year. Bob looked to our lawyer for help. This is a notarized document, so dividing the money in Catherine's account isn't possible. Bob looked dejected upon hearing this. Despite all the discussions we had, he seemed to have conveniently forgotten. Maybe he was having so much fun with the affair that it slipped his mind. He then asked if I could reduce the alimony but I refused as there was no reason to do so. In the end, the small amount of property division wasn't enough to cover the alimony, and Bob had to take on debt. 
Moreover, Sarah was also sued for alimony by her ex-husband, Bob's father. Bob and Sarah ended up living together, blaming each other for their situation, and both working from morning till night. I ended up living with my mother in a house, and I was hired as a cosmetic surgeon again. My mother is enjoying her retirement, occasionally going on trips and having a good time. I'm not sure if I'm being a good daughter, but seeing my mother's happy face makes me feel happy. I don't know if I'll get married in the future, but even if I don't, I'm determined to live a life that I can feel happy about.